thank you very much, gentlemen, for inviting me and for a lunch that is totally appropriate to when I'm speaking about chefs. Uh, uh, fish is number one on their menu, fish and patties. Have any of you been to Shepherd? Uh, your acting uh, chairman, he had been. Anybody else have been to Shepherd? You just have, well, uh, you'd have a pretty long, long view because it's 180 miles away. That was Altney is the next step. Shetland is the one beyond that. Now, I do have, I'll just get outside some pictures on the board. <laughs> have a look at any pictures or I'll just put them up there. Shetland is the northernmost tip of the British Isles. Not very big, in fact it's just a small <coughs> outcrop of rock. But the people there think and act as though they're a separate country. They think they are. They're a very independent crowd of people. And there's three, I would say they're the most friendly, hospitable people you would ever wish to meet. But uh, there's three things that does upset them, and they say, please do get this right. One is the name. It is Shetland in the singular. If you speak of Shetlands, you're speaking of the Polonies. Although Shetland is an archipelago of over 100 islands. And the vast majority are not big enough to sustain life. But 17 of them um, are inhabited. The <coughs> population is roughly 22, just a, a tad under 22,000. Spread under 17 islands, so there's plenty of space. But although it is multiple islands, the title is Shetland. The second thing is where it is, they, they get a bit uh, peeved at times, they call themselves the Boxed Islanders because they're always depicted on maps, or nine times out of ten, they're depicted on maps in a box on the top right hand corner. <laughs> that is not where they are. They are much further north than most people ever think they are. It's 60 degrees north. And the northernmost tip of Shetland is parallel with the southernmost tip of Greenland or Anchorage in Alaska or St. Petersburg. So they are quite far north. To get there, you can, Aberdeen is the most popular jumping off point. And by one way or other, get to Aberdeen. And then you can either fly, which is one hour on a plane that shape travels and rolls. And you have to yell in the person next to you's ear to heard or you can trust your luck on the ship that goes every night uh, but it takes 14 hours on good night because it's 180 miles from Aberdeen to Shetland. Lowick is the only town that is 95 miles north of John the Road so you know, it's a long way up. And the third thing that really upsets them is if you say they're Scots Oh, that's thing coming out there is. They are not Scots. They say that Shetland, then if you probe a bit further, they would say they are British. <coughs> if you probe a bit further, or you say, are you Scots? No. Are you European? No. No, they are of Viking descent. Um, Shetland was part of the Viking Empire until 1469. And although they were governed by Vikings for about 500 years, that has had the biggest impact on the islands ever since. More so than Scotland, Scottish influence, it is the Viking influence. And when they've done DNA tests, lots and lots of the population are descended from Vikings. And uh, to that end, they, their culture is Viking, the names, a lot of the names are Viking. And this is the middle, as you're a gentleman, uh, the gentleman's gathering, this is the middle of the Upheliar season. Now, you may not have heard of Upheliar, funny word, it really means it's the end of the Christmas festivities.
activities. Now, I was telling um, Keith that uh, in Shetlands, they are far behind the times in a, a matter of timing. In 1752, we changed our calendar from the Gregorian to the Julian, no, the other way around, Julian to the Gregorian calendar. We lost 12 days, anyway. But at the time the news of that reached Shetland, they didn't believe it. That's a little bother. And still, to this day, on one of the outer islands and on the most northerly island, Christmas Day is celebrated on January the 6th, New Year's Day is January the 13th. They don't have the 12 days of Christmas, they have 24 days of Christmas. So the 24 days of Christmas come to an end round about the end of January, which coincides with the old people in the old days noticing that the sun was returning, the days were getting longer. Well, in the Viking traditions, they always went home for the dark winter. And then as soon as they saw the days were getting lighter, it was the open season for the rape and pillage. Off we went on our voyages of, you know, conquering the invasion, the rape and invasion, rape and pillage and all that. But before they left on their new season, they had one big party, knees up, call it what you like, um, where they had feasting and lots of fire and uh, it was an all-nighter. Well, in Shetland, they still do the same. Not great children, I'm not allowed to say that. But in the Shetland Islands, um, spread over the islands, there are nine up heliars. And up heliars, the Lerwick one, which is the biggest, is, I'm afraid, men only. Um, the men of the, when you get to be 16, you are invited, if you're a boy, you're invited to join a squad. Now these squads can have all sorts of origins. It can have origins in the scouts. Rotary have got a squad. It can be the fire brigade, the police, the lifeboats, um, people who live in a the street. There are 48 of these squads, all with various origins. And when you're 16, you're invited to join one. And you usually stay in that squad for life. And it is something that creates community spirit. Once you belong to that squad, that squad help one another out. One of my relations, um, her husband um, had cancer, had to go off to Aberdeen. She lived 25 miles from the airport, couldn't drive. Never once did she want for a lift. The squad members were there. They are a support, they do things for each other in their squad. But well, once a year, on the last Tuesday in January, it is Up Heliar in Lerwick. It starts off Up Heliar in Scalloway, which is a smaller place, then Up Heliar in Lerwick, and then the other places round about. But well, on November the 1st, the preceding November the 1st, uh, the boys called the Galley Boys build the most beautiful galley. Oh, it is, it's 30 feet long. And it's got a dragon's head and tail and a mast. And, oh, it, it's built on the chassis of a lorry, so it can be dragged. But it is beautiful. It is varnished, decorated. No, nothing. They're shipwrights plus helpers that do it. And it takes from January the 1st until mid-January. Um, sorry, from November the 1st to mid-January to create this. Well, they work on Monday and Wednesday nights in a special shed called the Galley Shed. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, they have what they call the Torch Boys. That's the other half of the men. And they make torches about this high, I suppose, a shaft with rolled up hessian on the top that is then <coughs> soaked in paraffin. On the appointed night, everybody, 970 this year, geysers, they call them, take part in the procession. Well, one of the 48 squads is the Jarl squad, and the geyser Jarl is in, is in charge for the night. He is given the freedom of the town for 24 hours, and all of his squad are dressed as Vikings, and they have to make their costume themselves. The other 47 squads do an act. Now, it can be anything. 
usually is taking the mickey out of the council, out of the local governments and national government, any event that's happened. And they get together as a squad and they have to do an act, which is a skit, lampooning somebody or something. And of course they are dressed in fancy dress. So all these men, 970 of them this year, all arrived at the start of the procession, dressed in goodness only knows what, as penguins, women, oh, you, you, to see them, it's truly amazing. And at half past seven, all the street lights are turned out, the Coast Guard sends up a rocket, and that's the sign for the light up, and all of these um, torches that have been soaked in paraffin go up in a blaze, and the light, when 900 odd torches are all ablaze, is quite something, plus the fumes of the paraffin. And then they all form themselves in the march, they march round the town, and some of the younger element drag the galley. Some are dragging it, some are great boys on the back. And they go all the way around the town until they get to the park. The uh, galley goes in first, and they put the galley in the centre of the park. All the people with torches all go around in a circle and uh, come to a standstill. They all sing a song and give three cheers for up here are. And at a certain signal, all the torches go into the galley. Up it goes. And the bigger the blaze, the better they like it. And this beautiful galley, and it really is a work of art to see it, just goes up in flames. And they all stand round. They sing another traditional song. And then they all go off. There are 12 public halls in Lerwick. They all go off on various coaches or vehicles, the ladies go into the halls and the ladies stay put in the halls. And then these 48 squads in their various vehicles all got to an order, they go round Lerwick into each hall, they do their acts, which is hilarious in many respects. If any of the local council have done anything that's a bit uh, naughty, <coughs> a bit iffy or anything like that, it will come out at Up Heliar. All the councillors, uh, they are lampooned, they take the mix, something shocking. Mm. Um, or I say in the local government, this year, um, Obama, of course, that's been um, topical. They've had a squad um, for Obama. Strictly Come Dancing's been a, another squad that's been popular this year and some of the reality shows on the television. Well, when I went, my husband and I went to Up Heliar, we went into the hall, it was 20 to 9 Tuesday night, we came out quarter to 8 Wednesday morning. <laughs> it's the all-nighter to the nighters Food, mountains of it, <coughs> soft drinks, tea, coffee, well, it's oceans of it. If you want any of the hard stuff, you have to take your own and go in another room and drink it. So it's for families, uh, it's a wonderful, um, wonderful life. night. But as they say, they're recognising their roots and it's the community spirit that keeps them together. It also does raise, it costs quite a bit, but then they go round all the shops and businesses and everybody contributes towards the cost. But of course, those taking part in up here, all these men, they don't shave or have their hair cut. From when they come back from their holidays, about August time, they don't shave or have their hair cut, so they're all hairy. <laughs> um, and when, as soon as that pen yard's over, over, they've sponsored haircuts and things like that. And they raise, goodness knows, thousands. Because the other thing, which I'll uh, just mention briefly, in Shetland, they are the most charitable people and they can prove it. They raise more money per head for charity than anywhere else in the British Isles. And they have a Rotary um, Club in Lerwick, but at most, I say practically every charitable organisation, <coughs> they've got a project on at the moment. It's called Clan 123. People in Shetland have very good primary care Medically, I'm talking about. Um, they have 
medical centres, but anything, any seriousness, they have to go to Aberdeen. They have got a small hospital that's got three wards, a men's, a women's, a maternity, and um, geriatric, sorry, four. But it is only a small hospital that deals with minor ailments, minor operations. Anything big, you have to go to Aberdeen, which you can understand is quite traumatic. Because Shetland has fallen into two halves. As those that roam the world, like Vikings, you know, the school trip, we might think as, you know, it's adventurous going on a school trip to the Lake District. They have school trips to the Great Wall of China and you know, Australia and things like that. Um, but the other half of Shetlanders, there are people who've never left their own island. They just don't go anywhere. And if people have to go to Aberdeen, well, it's quite traumatic, for, apart from the trauma of being ill or having an operation or whatever, um, even leaving the island and going to Aberdeen into a city with traffic and traffic lights and shops and crowds and things like that. Especially if children are involved, if it's a children, a child is rushed off to Aberdeen, <coughs> somebody's got to go with the child. Well, Aberdeen Hospital does have um, a hostel run by the Red Cross which is clean, which is a bed, but it's a bit austere. The Shetlanders themselves have raised money for Clan 1 of the first part. They have bought a large house which had already had extensions to it. They've had more extensions added. This house is being converted into, well, I don't know quite what you'd call it, hostel, a home where Shetlanders going with people, or if people have to go to um, Aberdeen Hospital for radiotherapy, attend hospital maybe for half an hour a day, but they can't go home in between times, where they can go and stay, they have their own room with a television and tea and coffee facilities and all that. There is, they will be able to get a meal, but more, most important, it is manned and staffed by people who can give support. I won't say counsellors exactly, but you know, people who are used to dealing with people in a state of great anxiety and trauma. That there'll be a sympathetic ear, there'll always be somebody on hand to help. And so that is the big project at the moment, because they're doing all this themselves. They didn't have an MRI scanner in Shetland, they used to have to go to Aberdeen for that. So the Shetlanders allowed themselves 18 months to raise a million pounds by their own scanner. They did better than that. In a year, they raised a million and a half. So not only did they buy their own scanner, they got the, the cabin or porter cabin or whatever it's called to house it. But I say they're independent people. They think they're a country on their own. They do their own thing, yes, they um, claim all the benefits of the national health, but they go over and beyond. They do their own thing as well. And at the moment, the charitable organisations are all pulling together for Clan 123 to get this place set up. Now, I could go on yapping endlessly, but um, I'm uh, aware that you have to finish. So if anybody has any questions other than that, Oh, I'll tell you about him. I said they don't waste anything on Shetland because the carriage they have to pay on things bought from the mainland is quite prohibitive. This little fella, everybody all says we were are, he's a recycled jumper. They don't throw things away. So if you've got jumpers, um, you can have them recycled. They cut the good bits out and make the bare and the bits, you know, the shaggy bits that of stuffing inside. If you go round Shetland, you're out in the countryside, you'll very often come across crops that have got most unusual roots on their outbuildings. That's their boats. When their boats are no longer seaworthy, they just turn them upside down and they're the, they become the roof for the hen houses and garden sheds and things like that. They're, well, I think they must have invented recycling. They don't waste anything. But that's because they have to. And uh, 
I say Shetland is a lovely place to visit as long as you don't want to um, you know, go for the sun because the weather in Shetland, well there's only one word for it, that's disgusting. <laughs> their winters are mild. They've had their temperatures this winter from January the 1st up until last weekend. There's only been four days when their temperatures have been colder than ours. But the wind is the big bug there. To have gales of four, eight, nine, ten, eleven, well, it's, it's just commonplace. You know when we had that big blow in 1987, it was all headlines everywhere. Um, my relatives, um, their next door neighbour was in London, and when he went home, they said, "Oh, what was it like in London?" Oh, he says, "No worse than we had six or seven times every winter." <laughs> that uh, they're used to it because everything is geared. Obviously there's not so many people. They don't live as close as we do. Houses are not as close as ours. There are no trees to fall down. In the streets there's nothing hanging. No shop signs, no holdings, nothing like that. So the wind can blow and blow and blow. Nothing will blow away because it would have been blown away years ago anyway. <laughs> so they are geared up and well, they can just cope with any of the weather that's thrown at them. But uh, they are, I say, very independent, charitable, friendly people. Mm. But if you want to go to a country and not have to take your passport, Shetland's the place to go. Mm -hmm. But if anybody has any questions, I'll try and answer them for you. Are you Shetland yourself? Uh, I should say, no, I'm not a Shetlander. My husband, um, his mother was a pure Shetlander. Um, and she had the cultural uh, shock of all cultural shocks. She lived in Lerwick. My father-in-law lived in Weymouth. Can't get much further apart than that. But uh, my father-in-law was in the customs and excise, and he was sent to Shetland in the fishing season because in those days the shoals of fish used to go around the coast, and the, the, the ships, uh, the fishing boats went with them. And they did fishing, yes. Well, when they got to Norway, they used to have a lot of um, German, Norwegian, and uh, Dutch ships. There was no customs presence in Shetland, so he was sent there. And in one of the hotel, on the reception, there was this nice looking lady. The rest is history. Mm -hmm. But they married in Shetland, and she came, sailed away with her new husband, who by that time had got his new posting, and his new posting was to the London docks. <laughs> and their house that went with the job was in Poplar, so she moved from Shetland to Poplar. That is quite a culture shock. And it's one that she took to, and she didn't ever go back. So my husband spoke the way all the rest of us do. He was born and brought up here. But all my in-laws, they all live in Shetland, and this is how I come. Oh uh, yes, I've been back for five weddings and uh, not a funeral, but uh, um, I go back whenever I can. So I just love it. Yes, yes, sir. What a fascinating and informative uh, advocate you are for the Shetlands. Um, a peculiar thing came to me when you were talking about the, the burning of the boat. I think you said it went on a, a lorry chassis. Do they supply a new chassis every year? Oh, no, no, it's lifted off. No, it, it, it hasn't got the front of the lorry, it's just on like a lorry chassis. No, it is, it's got straps that go underneath it and it is lifted off. And the chassis, they take it out from underneath, yeah. and they've got like a cradle in the park made of wood, which obviously they make. They have a new cradle every year, and up it goes. And the brass band, they're there, and they play "Blaze Away." You know that? And the galley's <laughs> blazing away, and the band's playing. <laughs> then everybody goes off into the halls, and uh, yeah. it's a uh, fair game after that. But you should see. On Wednesday morning, when you see them going home, a bit the worse for wear, and everybody's tired, 
there's men in stiletto heels and <laughs> dresses and they all go tottering off home because some people call it Transvestite Tuesday. <laughs> there's so many men. They said if there's an alien looking down, they must wander, you know, well, see all these well uh, lorries and coaches, because they haven't got 48 coaches on Sherman, so they've got milk floats and lorries, any vehicles to get them round. And all these men dressed... Well, I was dancing in a set, doing a, a, a rig, a, a jig, and uh, in our set, one man was dressed as uh, Captain Webb, you know, who swam the channel. Yeah. You know, long one piece. Uh, long one long piece. Long but over the top of it, it's got a fluffy penguin outfit. <laughs> and uh, there was somebody next to me who's dressed as a lion. And one night, one up heavy after the lifeboat was called out. Well, of course, all the lifeboat crew that are all, all there, and they had to just down everything and go. And uh, a ship had dragged its anchor, actually, it was just about in danger of heaving up onto the opposite island. And they were astounded. Under their oilskins, they could see they've got two Vikings, a fairy and a lion. <laughs> <laughs> Says it all, doesn't it? <laughs> Ken, you want to ask something? Well, I, okay. Uh, you said uh, the anathema to, say, Scottish. Uh, what is the accent? Um, it is the Shetland dialect. It's um, it started Norwegian, the, the language. Then that came into what they call Norn, N O R N, the Norn. And now English words have crept in, or more than crept in. It is you can understand them, but if they speak their dialect, they still have their own words, um, nouns for wildlife, flowers, and things like that. Um, Otters are draxies and uh, daisies are cockalories and uh, they've got their own nouns for just about everything. And you get two Shetlanders together so speaking dialect. You don't stand a chance. Um, they just call it Shetland dialect. When they speak proper English, as they do on the phone or to other people, it is a lilt. It is not the hard Glaswegian Scottish. It is very much a musical lilt. It's quite an attractive way of speaking they have. Um, it's not the guttural hard Scottish at all. But uh, they've got their own Shetland dialect. They call it, we, we speak dialect. Can I just ask you, because you mentioned that MRI scanner is covered by National Health, you say. So if there is a big enough hospital, uh, provisions of treatment, probably the National Health would have provided this MRI. So my question is, is there a big enough hospital there? Is there provisions of acute treatment like acute head injuries or, you know, things like that? Would they come to Aberdeen? Aberdeen. They, they claim to be very good at stabilizing people and getting them ready. They have an air ambulance. Um, and if that can't go, Oscar Charlie is the helicopter which they stabilise people and they take them to the um, airstrip, which is run by the council, and onto an, an air ambulance. And they have, I think it's about three or four doctors who have got their wings, um, and they have nurses who have their wings as well, who are trained to look after patients while they're up in the air and then they're off to Aberdeen. And about the only thing, they take appendix out in Shetland, they now do cataracts but that is only in about the last five years they've removed cataracts in Shetland. But they're doing growing toenails and you know minor things like that. But anything, even a bad break for a leg or an arm you have to go to, uh, to Shetland. But now they have a scanner and somebody who can uh, use it and who radio who can get the results. Because you can imagine every time you did a scan, you had to go 180 miles there, 180 miles back. Oh, sorry, the industries. Uh, sorry, the um, chief employment is the council because the council has to do everything. Um, plus they've got aircraft ferries and things like that. The second is fishing. Uh, Monetary-wise, fishing is the biggest money spinner. 
it's aquaculture, which is salmon farming and trout farming, which Shetland, the coast of Shetland has lots of what they call valleys, like fjords only not as big. The deep, cold water, and they farm salmon and tra sea trout. They also farm mussels and oysters. Then, of course, there's the actual fishing of white fish, that their biggest fishing is the pelagic, that's the herring and the mackerel. And they've got the biggest um, processing factory in Europe, in Shetland. If you like your smoked mackerel, there's, um, well, more than England's chances, almost a certainty that it, it, came, it was landed and processed in Shetland. Um, smoked mackerel, tinned mackerel, herring, the same. Um, and there's the shellfish industry as well. Third is oil, because oil was pumped ashore there in 1970, and Shetland slept for centuries, and in 40 years it's nearly caught up with us. And that is the <coughs> coming of the oil. The oil is pumped ashore and stored at Sulham Vale, and oil tankers go and take the crude oil, and uh, then it's dispersed. So that is next, um, and then the agriculture, that includes sheep because Shetland has about 400,000 sheep. This is Shetland wool, and it is the <coughs> agriculture which includes sheep, um, selling the fleeces, selling the wool, selling the sheep for meat, um, and then the home industries, ladies make these. Make, this is a Shetland jumper. And you can also tell Shetland knitwear, no seams in it. So um, they knit shawls and jumpers and you name it. So that is third. Tourism is fourth. Um, the ponies are almost a no-no now. They used to breed them for pit ponies, but of course it's not for the pit ponies. So it's just a few ponies that pony clubs might want. There are ponies roaming around. They do belong to people. They're like the dark ponies. Know, but, um, yeah. Did you hear the question? I wondered if the name Dixon would mean anything to your husband. I had a Shetland partner for 25 years, he came to me, I think, in 1955, he'd been in the uh, in the Hebrides, the government bet in the Hebrides, and his father was headmaster of Lowick School for Europe. Dixon? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, well, I know he's all his life, so he died, mm -hmm. and he left in mm -hmm. the 80s. And, uh, Are you? Jimmy Rind was um, a head there, and he was head there. But the It'll vet, be way back. About a few, yeah. <laughs> well, it probably wouldn't to me, but I'm sure Dixon, D I X, not D I C K. D I X, alright. Yeah, I'll have to make inquiries. But the vet now is Edwin Moore. Uh, has a, a big uh, practice in Norway when they have a collaboration. He was a yes. very quiet sure. chap, he's been there for 20 years, yes. yes. I never got to know much about him. Yes, I'll have to make inquiries over that. Um, yes, Dixon going back. I say it might be a bit before his time. Yes, thank you.